Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, I would like to talk about one very important rule which we can use when um, we are trying to determine uh, indeterminate limits. Um, this rule is called L'Hopital's rule. Well, obviously L'Hopital is the person, French mathematician. French or Italian? I'm not sure. Anyway, um, it's a uh, very interesting rule. It's uh, formulated very simply uh, and it can be proven basically relatively simply as well. But it's a very powerful rule. Now, um, before going into the details, let me just do this general introduction. So this particular lecture is part of the course of Advanced Mathematics presented on Unisor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website because it has very detailed notes it's like a textbook plus um, uh, people who register uh, can use the site to basically take exams for instance any number of exams if they want to the site is free so everybody is welcome now back to L'Hopital's rule this is by the way how it's spelled L'Hopital's rule Okay, so let's imagine that you have certain uh, limit which is indeterminate and in this particular case I'm talking about indeterminate form of 0 over 0. Um, basically what um, this particular rule, L'Hopital's rule, says that if you have a ratio of two functions and both of them are converging to zero uh, when x converges to some particular limit value. Then, instead of um, determining the limit of this ratio, you can try the ratio of their derivatives. And the rule, L'Hopital's rule, says that under certain circumstances, instead of this limit you can take this limit which might be easier now actually there are three different forms of L'Hopital's rule they have um, certain degrees of um, applicability so let me start from the very basic form so consider you have two functions defined on some segment and these functions we assume to be sufficiently smooth when I'm talking about smoothness it means differentiability and and uh, uh, and continuousness um, now the continuity of, uh, of, of a derivative is obviously also part of the smoothness so whenever we need some something which requires uh, continuity I assume it's given or wherever we are talking about the derivative I assume that the function is differentiable so let's assume that our two functions are relatively smooth sufficiently to to basically make the whole uh, thing work and the proof actually to work so these are smooth functions and let's assume that um, they both go to zero at particular point x0 so limit of f of x where x goes to x0 equals to limit of g of x as x goes to x0 and it's equal to 0 and that's what actually makes this an indeterminate form because if it's not the case I would have certain concrete values which are not equal to zero well primarily the denominator not equal to zero and then I can just go with limit of their ratio as being ratio of their limits but considering both of them are zero this cannot be done this way so let me just analyze this particular um, equality of this limit to this limit um, in one concrete case 
Now the concrete case is the following. Let's say I have two functions uh, f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3 and g of x is equal to minus x squared mm, plus 7x minus 12. Okay, let's wipe out this for a, for a second. We will put a better picture later on. Now, if I would like to know the ratio of these as x goes to 3, now if I substitute 3, that would be 9 minus 6 minus 3, that's 0, and this is um, 9 uh, minus 9 plus 21, that's 12 minus 12, 0. So basically these functions are exactly the ones which we are talking about they are uh, defined on an entire set of real numbers and uh, they are smooth obviously um, and uh, at point x uh, equals to 3 both of, uh, both of them are converging to 0 so if I would like to know what is the limit of this ratio I cannot just simply substitute 3 however in this particular case I can notice that this is equal to x minus 3 times x plus 1 and this is equal to x minus 3 times uh, what 4 minus x am I right minus x square mm, minus plus 3x plus 4x 7x minus 12 right and if I divide 1 uh, by another, obviously x minus 3 can be reduced and I will have x plus 1 divided by 4 minus x and at x equals to 3 this actually goes to 4 over 1 which is 4. So the limit of the ratio of these doing whatever arithmetic I just did is equal to 4 as x converges to 3. Now, this is a simple case when I can really factor out 3 and then I can divide both numerate, numerator and denominator by 3 and simplify the picture. In many cases, that's not possible. This is good only for polynomials. Now, if you have some more complex functions which also equal to 0 um, at the point where the x is converging then you cannot really do something like this. However, let's consider the graphics of this. So, if this is the graphs, so the first function has x minus 3 and x plus 1, so it's minus 1 and 3, and it's some kind of a parabola, right? At 0 it's equal to minus 3. So that's my first function. My second function is parabola will, uh, um, will be reversed in direction and that's also 3 and 4 minus uh, which means 4 so it's something like this. So parabola would be maybe something like this. So as x goes to 3 both of these functions are converging to zero. But let's compare these functions with these derivatives. This is the tangential line of the first one and this is a tangential line of the second one. Whenever you div divide function by function, considering that tangential line are very very close to um, the uh, function graph at the point of tangency it seems reasonable to assume that the ratio between the um, the tangents would actually be equal to the ratio between the values of the functions why well let's just take one particular increment from x0 this is x0 to x0 plus delta x so, and let's put the perpendicular here. 
So it has four uh, intersections. The top one is intersection with the first function. Next one would be intersection with a tangential line. Then would be intersection with tangential line with the second function. And the fourth intersection would be with the function itself. Now, as you see, these two points are very close to each other and these two points are very close to each other. So instead of ratio between the functions, I can actually assume that the, func uh, the ratio between um, uh, the uh, y coordinates um, when, when I'm intersecting the straight lines, tangential lines, would actually be very close. Now, can I prove it? Well, let's just think about it. It's really not very difficult. Let's just consider what is um, a, a derivative. Um, now, derivative is f of x plus, well, x0 plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x, right? And this is my derivative x0 at point x0. So what can I actually say? Now, this is the limit as delta x goes to 0. What can I say from this is the following, that f of x 0 plus delta x minus f of x 0 is equal to f of x 0 plus some infinitesimal, um, infinitesimal variable, epsilon. So as delta x goes to 0, this is infinitesimal. Now, f of x 0 is 0, so we can just forget about this. So, we can actually say that this is f of x. As x goes to x0, these two things these two things are very close to each other. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to multiply it by, by delta x, sorry. So that's plus epsilon times delta x, right? So, which is equal to f of x0 delta x plus epsilon delta x, right? So, my value of the function at point x, which is this, it's x0 plus, uh, plus delta x, is equal to some constant value, which is the derivative at point x0, multiplied by infinitesimal, plus another infinitesimal, multiplied by this same delta x infinitesimal. So my point is that this is an infinitesimal of a greater degree of being infinitesimal than this one, than, 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 than this one. Why? Because there is an extra infinitesimal. So this is infinitesimal times constant. This is infinitesimal times infinitesimal. Right? So what we can say this is equal to what? If I will take the ratio of these two things, if I will take the ratio of these two things, Same thing with, with g, right? So f of x divided by g of x. So it's this big um, um, segment divided by the smallest one. The biggest divided by, by, by the smallest, right? It's equal to uh, f of x0 plus epsilon divided by g of x0 plus, epsilon, plus delta. It's different, obviously it's different, right? Because delta x would, would be cancelling out. So delta x is basically the difference between x and, and, and x0, right? So it would be here delta x and here delta x, and we cancel them out. As x approaching x0, as x approaching x0, I can say that limit of this thing is limit of, is, is equal to limit of this thing, right? And assuming that the limit of this, well, assuming that this value is not equal to, 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 to zero, I can actually put that the limit of this is equal to 
uh, ratio of limits and ratio of limits it's obviously converging to this so this is kind of an analysis I would like to introduce certain intuitive feelings into this theorem that it does make sense we are just replacing the ratio between the functions with the ratio between tangential lines between uh, uh, to these functions at this particular point where both functions are converging to zero and again why I could do it because tangential line is different from the function itself by an infinitesimal which is of a very high order it's much higher order than something like these two functions are converging to zero and they're also infinitesimal because one is infinitesimal times constant another inf is infinitesimal times in another infinitesimal and since it's a higher order we can basically disregard these little differences this little difference between these two and this little difference between two when I'm approaching this point these differences actually are um, negligible negligible relative to the real ratio between the functions or between the tangential lines okay this is just a general idea now what did I use in this particular case obviously I use that the derivative of the g function at point f0 is not equal to 0 otherwise I could not do, uh, divide it so I assume that, um, that that's true so whenever I'm talking that limit of this is equal to limit of this as x goes to x0 and this in turn is this limit of this is in turn equals to f star f uh, derivative of x0 divided by g derivative of x0 I assume that this is not equal to 0 and this is basically my first basic theorem which let me just formulate it again that the under certain uh, smooth conditions etc um, the limit of this ratio is equal to ratio of the derivatives at the point of limit provided this derivative not equal to zero now how can it be proven a little bit more um, rigorously rather than using all these concrete examples it's actually a very simple thing limit of this as x goes to x0 is equal to f of x minus f of x0 divided by g of x minus g of x0 why? because f of x0 and g of x0 we have agreed that these are both equal to 0 and that's why we have an indeterminate um, form of limit equals to f of x minus f of x0 divided by x minus x0 divided by g of x minus g of x0 x minus x0 why can I do it? well because x minus x0 would cancel out, right? this is exactly the same as this this goes to denominator, this goes to numerator, and both have x minus x0. Now, and I forgot to put the word limit. And if the limit of this thing exists and not equal to 0, which means function g is differentiable, and the g derivative of x0 not equal to 0 under these circumstances limit of the ratio is equal to the ratio of the limit so it would be 
limit of f of x minus f of x zero divided by x minus x zero divided by limit of g of x minus minus g of x zero divided by x minus x zero as x goes to x zero. And this is equal to derivative at point x zero divided by derivative at, at point x zero by definition of the derivative. So this limit is equal to this if this thing is not equal to zero, of course. And this is basically the first rule uh, of uh, L'Hopital, uh, L'Hopital's rule, uh, and we all call it basic, basically, right? Because it assumes certain things about this. Now, what's wrong about this basic? Why do we have to really um, think about a little bit stronger um, approach? Well, for a very simple reason. What if this I I is equal to zero? It means we can't really use it, basically, right? But I would like, actually, to have, I would like to use this function, recurs this rule, recursively, which means if I cannot get that limit, I will go to um, the first derivatives, and I will use first derivatives. If I can, but if I cannot, I'll use the second derivative. So I will apply the rules uh, recursively. And if it is possible, and if it is actually, you know, if it delivers certain reasonable results, that's great. If not, I'll probably lose my patience, and I will stop doing it, and I'll say I just can't do it. But in any case, this recursiveness of the rule is very, very important. Because sometimes you have to really uh, use uh, the L'Hopital's rule twice to get something more reasonable and really have some concrete example of, uh, uh, of, if it, of it, it, its effectiveness, right? So, for this we will use a general L'Hopital's rule. And let me just talk to general L'Hopital's rule, which is a little bit less restrictive in this particular case. Now, it actually formulates practically the same way as this one. This is the formulation. And I'm not continuing this further with f prime of x0 divided by g prime of x0. Because I suspect that it might not really exist or something like this. So let me just do something like this. And, uh, and here we will actually, uh, we are actually dealing with um, general form of uh, L'Hopital's rule. Now, here is a more precise formulation. Let's consider you have these functions defined on segment AB. And um, let's consider the point A, because that's what's very important in this case. I would like, actually, to have only one-sided limit because then I can use a limit from another side. So that's, let's say it's plus A, which means I'm actually approaching my left boundaries from the right to the left. Then I would like to prove this, provided that, obviously, uh, whenever it's necessary, the, the respective smoothness is, is observed, etc. Now, how can I actually do this? Well. I can do it in exactly similar fashion, but I do need a little bit help. Now, you remember uh, in the previous lectures we were talking about um, middle value uh, theorems. There is a Lagrange theorem and there is a Cauchy uh, theorem. Let me just remind you, in case of Lagrange, if you have function, and this is A, 
and this is B. Now this is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a so it's angle this divided by this right this is difference between the function this is difference between arguments so the lagrange's middle mi middle value theorem uh, tells us that there is some kind of a tangential line which is parallel to this so the uh, the derivative at this particular point c is equal to this ratio. That's what Lagrange uh, rule says. Now, there is a little bit stronger Cauchy theorem which deals with two functions. Um, one function would be, let's say, f, another would be g, and then it would be Now, in case g of x is equal to x, this Lagrange uh, theorem gives us exactly what Cauchy theorem is. Uh, Cauchy, uh, the Cauchy theorem with this function gives exactly the same result as Lagrange. So it's a little bit more general thing. But anyway, I have proven this on a previous lecture, and that's what I'm going to use in this particular case. Now, um, so we will have my functions capital F and capital G and I also would like to use it not on very edge but I will take any point x which belongs to this uh, particular uh, interval from a to b so I took any point in between a and b call it x and according to the um, Cauchy theorem I can find point x0, let me just use another x0, where x0 belongs to ax, right? So x0 is supposed to be in between a and x, so that's what I wrote here. So x is anywhere in the, in the segment ab, and x0 the, uh, the Cauchy theorem says that exists such x0 when this is true. Now, what happens in this particular case? Well, in this particular case, we are dealing about um, indeterminate form. So, as before, f of x goes to 0 and g of x goes to 0 as x goes to plus a. So that's why it's indeterminate, right? In which case, considering functions f and g are smooth, which means they are continuous, uh, function value of uh, uh, functions f and g at point a should be equal to zero. So basically, I can say this. This is zero and this is zero. And here is what I have, very interesting equation right now. So if I take any point x on this interval, then there is a point x0 which is to the left of the x, in between a and x, where this is true. Great. Now, let's go to the limit, uh, plus a. So let's move x towards a. What happens? Well, obviously x0 also moves to exactly the same direction, right? So that means that this limit is equal to this limit plus a. 
that's exactly the same thing. Now, whether I'm using x0 here or x or any other letter, it doesn't really matter. We still have exactly the same equality here. So, limit of this, if it exists, obviously, if this limit exists, let me put it this way, as x goes to plus a, from this immediately follows that that this limit the same L exists under exactly the same circumstances. So, from if we will con consider it without the limits, if this is equal to that, where x is to the right, x0 is to the left, but both of them are to the right of a, right? This is a, this is x0, and this is x. This is b somewhere, okay? And if x goes to the a, it forces x0 to the left as well, and that's why the limits are the same. And this is basically what we have to really prove. That instead of doing this, we can try to do this. And maybe we will be lucky. Well, maybe not. Maybe we still have indeterminate form. But then, you see, this is a recursible, re recur recursive rule, basically. Because if I cannot do this, and it's still an indeterminate form, like 0 over 0, I can go to the next uh, step and took the second derivative, or the third derivative, etc. As many as I want. So that's what makes actually this general rule a little bit more general, if you wish, than the basic rule before, which assumes that the first derivative of g at point a actually exists and not equal to zero. Because in this case, maybe it is equal to zero, and this is equal to zero, and that's why we have another indeterminate form, and then why, and that's why we can move further to the second derivative, third, etc. Now, obviously, I was moving from the right to the a. Obviously, instead of a, I can move to the right uh, of uh, any other point from the right. And obviously, the same thing can be um, done exactly the same way from the left. So it actually, the theorem is actually true for any point in between as well. And this is the general um, L'Hopital's rule. Okay, and now I, will, I would like to extend this a little bit further, and that's the extended um, L'Hopital's rule. Now, what we were talking about before was only indeterminate form 0 over 0 on a finite uh, segment AB, right? So, f of x, that's what we were talking about, goes to 0 as x goes to, let's say, a, doesn't really matter. And g of x was also goes to 0 as x goes to a. And that's why we had an indeterminate form, f, of, uh, f divided by g. Now, actually, the L'Hopital's rule can be extended to... The boundaries can be inf infinite, and also the not only zero over zero indeterminate form can be um, uh, applied uh, to this particular rule, but also in, uh, infinity over infinity. So we are extending the L'Hopital's rule to basically everywhere, all kinds of um, different indeterminate. Uh, situations which we can have. So the value of the function can go to infinity and the value of the argument can go to infinity. Now I cannot really prove like all the different cases or address them but let me just give you a hint. How can we deal with for instance infinity? 
So what if I have this? How can I evaluate this? Okay, here is how. Basically, I would like to use one very simple property. Which is an obvious thing, right? So, I would like to reduce my infinity to zero by basically inverting the functions. How can I do it? Well, this is equal to limit x goes to a so instead of f of x I will put 1 over f of x in the uh, denominator and instead of g of x in denominator I will put 1 over g of x in numerator now is it better? yes it is better because in this case this goes to 0 and this goes to 0 so now I have 0 over 0 in determinate form and I can actually use the uh, general L'Hopital's rule, which gives me derivative derivative, right? Now, derivative of the compound function 1 over something is equal to minus 1 divided by g square of x, right? times derivative of the inner function. So basically I was using function 1 over x, but instead of x I have g of x. So derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x square. So in this case, since instead of x I have to put g of x, but since it's a compounded function, I have to multiply by the derivative of the inner function. Same thing here. So, this is f square of x times g of x divided by g square of x times derivative of x as x goes to a. So if we assume that this is equal to L and it exists, then this is, I can actually use it as a product of limit of this times limit of this. Now, what is limit of this? That's L square, right? And limit of this from which follows what? That this is equal to L, right? from which follows what? Well, obviously, limit f of x divided by g of x should be equal to L. I invert it, right? So, assuming that all these manipulations are legal, which means we do have certain limits, and we can replace limit of the ratio as ratio of the limits, etc. And that means that certain limits are not supposed to be equal to zero, so we can do it. So again, under certain normal assumptions, I would, guess, I, I, I would say, this manipulation actually leads to that the same basic rule that in case of f and g um, infinite, we still can have the same limit of the ratio of the function is equal to the limit of um, ratio of their derivatives. So that's one particular case out of many where we can extend this L'Hopital's rule. And that's it for today. I do suggest you to read the um, notes for this lecture because they actually contain all these proofs. 
um, maybe in a more um, kind of acceptable form than I was just trying to express. Uh, and there is a nice graph actually with a particular example which I was using before. And I do suggest you to pay attention to this. It's very important. And um, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.